Hello, everyone. Warm welcome to the How. Well, welcome also to the House. Uh, it's very good to see so many people here again uh, this afternoon. Um, many of you, we know already the talents, of course. Uh, many of you, uh, we welcome here warmly again uh, as guests, as people are coming in from the market or just from the streets of Berlin. Very nice to have you here. And as you probably know, Berlinale Talents is not only a place where we discuss what film is about or how film comes together. It's also a place actually where we gather many people from this year, 77 different countries. So it's a gathering of people from practically around the world. And I'm very, very happy to give this space and offer this space also to this discussion today and uh, to delve into something that is very important and uh, uh, important and wichtig, I would say, but it's important for us. Um, and without uh, much more further ado, I would love to just introduce you to a lovely colleague and also to a friend of us, uh, Matthijs Wouter Knoll. Matthijs running the European film market, uh, also a good friend of Berlinale Talents because you've worked here with us for many, many years. Matthijs, thank you very much for being with us here today. Please introduce us to your guest. Thank you, Florian. Welcome, everybody, as this uh, quite jam-packed uh, how-to. I think you've never seen this uh, room so full of people, and I think uh, all of you know very well who our guest is, so there's not much of introduction to do, but I still do it, and don't worry. Um, I think in the past week, um, Florian already said, at the European film market, at the festival, and in general, uh, many of us have been talking about a player in the industry that has had an impact on many things. Uh, how we watch films, how we think that we will see them in the future, how they will be financed, but also which kind of stories we can expect from uh, streaming platforms. Netflix, of course, being one of the major ones. And uh, today we have the pleasure of welcoming the vice president of original film at Netflix, who actually started in October last year with his job, he just told me. Um, so he's been doing a crash course and in the past four months basically did work for almost, it feels at worst, like a year, you said. Um, so um, he still found the time to come to Berlin for a couple of days for this session exclusively. And uh, I think uh, we should raise our hands again another time for Tendo Nagenda. Thank you. Then we'll talk uh, in the session, let me maybe explain a little bit to the audience what this session will be about, because there's, I think, a thousand and one questions that people have about Netflix and how it will impact their work and how it will impact the work of others and so on. Um, but we are here today with you, which means we'll talk about stories, which stories we're searching for, which stories could work for Netflix, and also how you want to work and with whom you'd like to work on those stories. I think um, having the pleasure of having you here in a room that is uh, the first in the first rows, but also in the rest of the audience, uh, jam-packed with talents that have been selected this year for Berlinale Talents. Uh, so we have the fin fleur of uh, a lot of countries, as, uh, as Florian just said, um, of people working on stories and trying to get them out in the world, uh, outside also the country they are from. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of questions from the audience as well, which I think we'll save a little bit for the second part of the session. Um, but of course, please feel free at, at some point you say like, listen, this is something I'd really like to react on, raise your hand and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I think also the session should in that sense um, be a unique chance to talk about the next steps you'd like to take, the kind of stories you will be looking for or maybe already things you're working on. Um, but also a bit like what um, the audiences are that you will be looking for, or what Netflix is looking for. So we can maybe relate it a little bit to a couple of things that I know that you've prepared um, that you think might be good examples of films that Netflix could have, and we'll talk about a little bit further. First of all, and also because we are, uh, we are here all together, I mean, the industry present also here in Berlin is at the end of the day, even though Netflix is a big organization, it's a people's business. So I think the fact that uh, you're sitting here, surrounded by all of us, and we have a chance to get to know you a little bit better, and also understand a little bit better what your work will be in the next uh, years to come, um, is a great chance for all of us. So thanks again for, for coming. I'd like to start, um, also because I think many people in the room probably will be curious about uh, that, you started at Netflix only a couple of months ago. You have worked in the industry for quite some years before. You were at Disney, you were at Universe, you worked for Warner, uh, you worked for Plan B, and a couple of other companies that we probably all know. 
Um, can you say a little bit about why you made a switch to a company of Netflix? Is there sort of like a thread in why you have made choices to work for companies in the industry and why it's interesting to move to Netflix for you? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a, a great room to be in. Um, the talent section, I saw, I saw there's 250 talents here from, from 80 countries, which is quite remarkable. Um, one of the things that I love about um, the Berlin Alley is how international and global it is. And it's also one of the things that drew me to Netflix as well. Um, I believe, well, we're in 190 countries, every country except for China, North Korea, and Syria. So um, I think that there's a natural um, relationship between what Netflix has to offer and what um, the Burnin Alley brings um, to the table as well from the, the standpoints of the films, the markets, and the, and the talents. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I switched, I, I moved to Netflix about four months ago. Um, and, uh, and prior to that, I'd been at uh, Disney for about eight and a half years. Um, a company I also really love that also has a global reach as well, at, uh, at Disney I was doing um, production for, let's say, global theatrical productions, uh, movies like Cinderella, live action Cinderella. I was doing the live action movies, not the animated movies, um, that were Disney branded. Uh, Cinderella, which uh, premiered here actually in Berlin in 2015, uh, Beauty and the Beast, movies like A Wrinkle in Time uh, last year. Um, and, and, and a few others that are still to come out and a few others that I haven't named um, and really enjoyed that. But um, what I saw in Netflix was an opportunity to do more kinds of films and in doing more kinds of films, both in terms of genre and in terms of budget, um, I also felt like it had the reach with those films um, uh, in a way that, that few few others have, or at least, in my opinion, was a leader in its ability to reach um, a mass audience with, with interesting stories told from uh, interesting points of view, uh, which I was finding harder and harder to do in, in the um, global theatrical space, you know, which is a lot more um, dependent on the size of the intellectual property that you have, um, or, or its ability to sort of be widely known on a global scale before you've even made the film. So that, that sounds also a bit like you felt at some point that uh, work for previous companies, you mentioned Disney, um, could be in the long run be sort of a um, hindering the way you could be able to work and bring stories to audiences that you'd like them to reach and not to be too much in that sense, limited in that way. Is that true or is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a personal decision. I think that there are a lot of people working at Disney who are, are flourishing and having a great time, and, and, I, and I did as well. Um, I just was, I had a, a, an interest and a curiosity to expand that a little bit more in terms of the reach, both in the number of films, but also who I could work with, and at what stage um, in their various careers that I, that I could do that with. Um, increasingly, I was making films that uh, that were that cost over a hundred million dollars in in production uh, spend. That's before marketing and distribution. And so, to find at that budget level, even if you see someone who's very talented who's done maybe you know a number of films um, that are fantastic. Um, it's a different enterprise to go up to 100 million um, plus um, in terms of, of, of what you have to deliver for that size of a budget. Um, at Netflix, you, I can do those films and I can do a lot, a lot more films and I can build with those filmmakers. I'm also not limited to um, a certain type of film that, that they might wanna do one of, but then not. I can do a, a, a drama. I can do a horror film, I can do a, a comedy, um, I can do a family event film, 
And so for me, um, I just felt like that was an opportunity to grow and to learn, and a combination probably of the experiences I'd had prior to Disney um, as well. You mentioned um, I worked at Plan B uh, for some time. We did a diversity of projects when I was there. Um, I worked at, uh, at a company uh, that became Good Universe, uh, where I worked on some horror films and some, some comedies as well. And I've just always had a, a, a large appetite for a, a number of genres of films. Um, but the film business in general, especially in the global theatrical space, um, has been challenged to sort of keep up a diversity of film and, and what what you're allowed to spend on those films depending on who makes them and who's in them um, and what they promise and different different companies have different um, strategies. Uh, Disney's is to make less movies but to make them at higher budgets for greater impact and I'd say that they're having a lot of success at doing that. Um, I just became curious about um, doing something a little bit different so it's less about Disney and what they can't do and more about Netflix and what I felt I could do there. Now I can imagine that if um, you get a phone call and say listen uh, we'd like to have you um, why don't you join us uh, I'm not sure if it went like that but it was there any moment at some point where you had to share with uh, the team of Netflix uh, what you and how you would envision to work or was it like a pretty clear profile in that sense of what you were supposed to do or is it something that you have I mean you just said you have a lot of freedom there will be a broad range of things you can do but i can imagine they were asking as well and also the reason why they picked you that they wanted to have some ideas and a vision from your side what what did you say yeah that's a that's a really good question um you know the conversations uh with netflix prior to me joining actually didn't come down as much to the specific types of films because the range of films were obvious in terms of of the possibilities a little bit, or at least that was a very short part of the conversation, which was any genre, all genres, this budget to infinity, depending on, on what the material was. Um, but that being said, I think that a lot of the types of films that I was working on at Disney um, are something that Netflix is interested in doing, so that was a natural correlation, um, but I would say, and I hope that at some point, if to the degree that it's ever talked about, um, I'll come to be defined not just by the films that I've worked on, but who, who I've worked on them with, and I've usually chosen or tend to choose my interest in projects based on who's envisioning that, both writers and directors, and um, as as luck would have it, um, a lot of the filmmakers I was working with at Disney are also working at Netflix, and so, but I was doing something different with them at Disney, and I couldn't necessarily continue on with them um, at Netflix or if Netflix was, was pursuing them. So um, everybody from Ava DuVernay to uh, Ron Howard to John Lee Hancock um, uh, to Tim Burton to Nikki Caro, um, just naming some directors where I'd, I could work with them at Netflix. So the conversation sort of um, revolved a lot of times around filmmakers and, and the interest and the common interest in filmmakers and then what we might be able to do with those filmmakers, both similar to what I was doing at Disney as well as the expanded um, reach of the other genres and types of films and budgets of films. I'd like to maybe, um, you, you chose a couple of clips uh, when preparing uh, for, to come to Berlin and I remember that when, uh, the, um, when we watched it to prepare the session as well, we had a lot of fun watching the clips, we'll see them in, a, in the next minutes to come. And I was kind of um, surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised, because you chose a couple of films that have actually nothing to do with Netflix at all. Some of them are like 30, 40 years old. And um, maybe you can say something why you felt this would be a nice way of bringing this as an example instead of maybe choosing the latest Netflix series that was presented somewhere last week, you know what I mean? Um, sure, so for, for context, and I won't say too much, I think the clips speak for themselves, but 
the, I was asked to, to choose clips. Um, so I think it's, it's, it would be odd to choose either clips that were self-promoting or um, advertising for Netflix. Um, so instead I chose, I decided to choose clips that I think uh, have endured the, the, the test of time for me specifically. Also, um, all of, ironically, these are films that I reference almost on a daily, if not weekly basis when thinking about new material and, and, and holding material I'm working on to a standard, specifically because they, they stand the test of time. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll kind of give more context on the other side. I suggest and like to ask if we can show the first two clips, um, which are, just to not surprise everybody too much, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones series, the first one, and secondly, uh, a clip from The Matrix. Um, could you play them one after the other? Thank you. So, uh, the Raiders of Lost Ark, uh, back then the first um, one of the unknown Indiana Jones series in a way, uh, big names attached, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas and so on, mm -hmm. uh, 1981 we're talking about, so that's quite a while ago. Um, I'm always wondering why people in um, Moroccan cities are running around in, in red uh, pants like that, it's not really helpful to like hide. Um, <laughs> a film that was top grossing, I mean, one of the biggest success uh, of, of that film year. The second clip straight after that is an interesting combination, uh, Matrix 1999, the Wachowskis, um, which had a huge effect, of course, on, uh, on action films in Hollywood uh, afterwards and in, on many other levels as well. Also very successful film. Uh, can you tell us something about, not so much about the combination, because it's a matter of time that we show them one after one another, but why these films for you are films that um, you feel fit into what you're looking for? Well, in both of them, first of all, they stood, stood the test of time, 1981 and then uh, 1999. Um, but they're both original ideas that come from um, specific points of view, um, but that also cast, a, in my opinion, a very wide net um, for different reasons. I mean, the setting in and around Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones, you know, distinctly kind of Western point of view, but global and travel and reach different places, um, and then bringing in some sort of uh, historical fiction, if you will, into it, but crafting an action adventure around that, um, and through that being able to to travel many places, something that we talk about a lot and don't see a lot of well-crafted stories in and around that, which is why I think, you know, people still talk about Indiana Jones 5 as opposed to um, a story that does similar things by any other name. Um, and then The Matrix, the Wachowski brothers, obviously, um, you know, from the mind of um, and creating a whole sort of sci science fiction um, creation that is still referenced, I think, to this day. But it was 1999, and I think um, both of those are examples of, of regular bets that the traditional studio system would take in and around the time that they were made, but that are much harder to take now. Um, but at Netflix, we're we're, we're very interested in those films. They're also mixed genre, action adventure, there's some drama, there's some real stakes, sci-fi, drama, action, what is the matrix? It's all of those things. Um, and I think that we're allowed to be, um, the plat what the platform of Netflix allows is for people to experiment um, a lot more readily with these genres and if engaged, to continue to, to do so, as opposed to, you know, what sometimes can be a bigger gamble and commitment um, in having to go out to a theater for new and original ideas. When I see these clips, I mean, uh, referring to the people that are now well, household names, back then they had a bit of a credit as well, but they were not the people that they are today, so to say. So the people behind these productions, people taking the risk, the companies behind these films took huge risks to develop, make, produce these films. 
of course, they became very successful. We know that now, 30, uh, 20 years later. later. Uh, does that mean that you're the original idea I, I get? I mean, I think it's, it's great to have a, a brilliant script with an idea that's completely convincing from the first moment and you know it will be worth every dime. But most of the time you don't know. So is that something where you feel, in this case, I mean, how do you deal with that yourself? How do you, and how far are you willing to take those kind of risks? How do you calculate that? Um, pretty far. I think the first thing that we have to do is deliver um, a message out to talent that we're open for business. So if you build it, to steal another quote from a, another film, um, if you build it, hopefully they will come. And I think one of the things that, um, that can be forgotten in, the, um, in looking at the Matrix or um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is that um, this was a part of a continuous business and obviously George Lucas and Steven Spielberg had created some sort of momentum and success for themselves but um, you know they largely created that from scratch based on childhood inspirations um, on the Matrix I believe that this was you know an idea that was written up by the Wachowskis on some level and they had three movies in their mind and probably every studio in Hollywood at some level tried to um, acquire the rights to, to make the movie even though they were attached to direct um, from the beginning when they hadn't directed anything. Um, but there was a system that allowed or encouraged the creativity um, and the idea that if you made something very compelling it could get made and get distributed successfully. I think the same thing exists now um, with Netflix, but also with other streaming platforms coming into the market, both in terms of um, doing large entertainment that has global appeal or ref uh, relevance, um, and then and then a, giving a new distribution platform that allows people to engage with content um, uh, in, in dynamic ways. One question before we go already to the next clip to just give a little bit of a different um, idea as well. Um, do you remember where you saw these films when you were in 81, you were young, but uh, where did you see that film for the first time? You remember that? I'd like to say I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark in the theater. I can't remember exactly, but I know that I, I watched it continuous on repeat in that clip in particular um, on VHS. So over and over and over on television. Um, the Matrix I saw, I saw in, a, in a theater in Los Angeles in Westwood um, a couple of times, yeah. And then, and then it was the first, um, or one of the first um, Blu-ray DVDs to come out that sort of helped com to get people very familiar with, um, with Blu-ray sales. So um, it both had success in, at the box office, but then also as a home video, um, part of a home video collection. We'll move to the next clip, which is a clip from the 96, uh, 76 film uh, Network, um, Sidney Lumet, about a television network and its struggle with poor ratings. Um, interesting choice as well. Let's uh, watch the clip of Network, please. So this film won four Oscars, um, very successful one as well. Um, famous quote, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take this anymore. Um, tell us something about like, why this film speaks to you, uh, Tendo. <laughs> um, I think it's relevant for everybody in the audience here. Uh, now, the um, 1976, as you said, four Oscars, I always felt like this was a movie uh, a movie written is how I describe it. The specific point of view, obviously, was directed by Sidney Lumet, legend, um, who did uh, fantastic work with it. But it was uh, it was written by Patty Chayefsky, won the Oscar for this, um, and um, and I felt like his specificity, the point of view, the ability to be truthful while also being entertaining and doing satire. Um, is extremely relevant and and underestimated because 
again, 76, so the film is, you know, 43 years old, almost, and still quite prescient if you watch the, um, if you watch it um, as I do every couple of years. It's inspired a Broadway play um, of the same name. Patty Chayefsky came from the theater, so there's a lot to it. Very hard move, movie to make in the uh, traditional studio system uh, today, but something that I think would be uh, amazing on Netflix, and we want to encourage voices like that that have that level of specificity and also ability to write and execute and then hopefully you know be directed towards something um, that stand out that's entertaining but also um, probably award worthy is something that we're we're highly interested in so you mentioned already uh, script um, screenwriting part being an essential part not only of this film obviously and many others but um, coming to script um, can you say something about when it comes to looking for stories, finding stories? At which stage are you normally getting interested in a project? Can it be an idea or do, would you require or would you prefer also to have a script to read to start with? How does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, one of the things that Netflix takes on, on board, which I, I'm in agreement with, is sort of a response to a studio system within a Hollywood that had become probably overly development reliant in the sense that there was a almost an economy for development that didn't necessarily predict accurately what would be made into movies. And so you were almost encouraged to overdevelop things by ideas, um, hoping that one would stick to the wall. So in the studio system, number of them very similar that I either worked directly in or uh, was associated with. This is a random number, but you would have, you know, 50 ideas to get to three or four movies in a year. Um, so you're spending a lot of bandwidth developing things that are not becoming movies. At Netflix, the goal is not to develop, it's really to make the films. And there's a large appetite to make films, and as a result, um, there's a low appetite to develop films. Essentially, what that means is we try to, we, we, we want to be able to see the film being made and released within a two year window. You know, that includes time to make it, cast it, prep it, um, post it, and then release it, um, and sometimes develop it. So the, 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 the short answer is, we love to see that in a script form, but if it's the right idea um, and we feel that we have a good chance of executing a script on it, we can buy things a lot earlier than, than script forms. Um, we buy articles, we've been, we buy articles, we buy um, um, intellectual property or books that we think can be developed, that we think will be attractive to talent, um, but we do that probably less than we, than we engage on something that we can read as a script. And as a result, we read a lot of scripts. Now, we're in Berlin here, we're in Europe here. There's like a whole network and a whole infrastructure of development labs and uh, development funding by uh, local, regional, national government bodies and so on. Uh, there's a lot of investment in that sense in the development of scripts, obviously also because that helps them to become better. Is that something that you, not wanting to be um, um, involved too much in the development stage yourself or with any of your team, is that something that you would worldwide in Europe but also outside of that, something which you would look at and say, listen, these are well-developed scripts or the chances of script being well-developed would be higher in specific labs or programs that you work with? Yeah, I think that any time, one of the hardest things I, I feel for feature films um, in the process of making them is, is essentially putting the work up before you have to make a gigantic investment. So there's, if it's theater, that's a, that's a lot, lot cheaper to put up and have the words spoken and see if they connect with an audience. Um, a lot of times you're spending 
time developing a script, but it's not been read aloud, it's not been read by actors, it's not been sort of worked over. Um, and I think that actually studios are not the best place to do that, generally speaking. Um, so I find that development of scripts by independent producers, companies, um, or other entities um, have a higher rate of, of success because they probably have more time to dedicate to the specific um, development of those ideas. And so we're always looking for well-written, well-curated um, stories in script form. We'll get to back to that later on, how we can do that and where we can send those great ideas, of course, at some point. Um, I'd like to move on to the last um, clip um, before we also um, move a little bit into the audience uh, at some point, which is the 1989 film Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee. Um, maybe let's just watch the clip and then we talk a bit about it. Controversial film, uh, Spike Lee playing him in the film himself. Um, tell us something about, uh, about uh, Do the Right Thing. Um, well, I think Do the Right Thing broke a lot of barriers. Um, it definitely made me aware of what was possible in terms of taking a specific experience and being very true to that experience and for that experience to be able to travel the world even though it comes from, you know, in this case, this small street in Brooklyn. Um, you know, I think to a large degree for its time, sort of a international success, uh, I believe it, came, it, it debuted at Cannes um, to, to great reviews and then caused a lot of controversy, but a lot of people talking about it, you know, dealing with in an entertaining way, um, ideas of um, race and tension gentrification was was mentioned <laughs> toxic masculinity is in this clip um, a number of things that just in the clip itself are, are very very potent and one of the things that I love about um, Netflix is that we encourage um, filmmakers and and ideas that touch a chord that that are going to make people um, feel something talk about something and so um, I feel like we are, we are the home and can be the home for films and filmmakers that have a distinct point of view, even if it makes you a bit uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, Do the Right Thing, I played that clip because it's, 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 it's personal to me, but I can take, you know, I thought about a million clips, as I'm sure we all would, of, of the films that sort of motivate or are, are, are on your mind all the time. You know, this was a precursor for another film I love uh, by Matthew Kasovich, a French film called Hate or La Haine, um, where he took a lot of inspiration from Spike Lee and Do the Right Thing. Um, you know, talking about a spe specific experience and then taking you there um, on a global level, Itumama Tambien is another one, City of God is another one. There, there are a number of films that sort of are, are indicative of having a point of view um, being very true to that point of view, and as a result of being specific, being you know widely uh, accessible on a global scale, and also um, a platform uh, at Netflix that allows 190 countries to discover that uh, the same day it's launched. So these were four clips of films that, if they would uh, be uh, coming in as an idea, they would be basically be convincing you, and they could be on Netflix as well. This yeah. at the moment, one hundred percent. We're talking out original ideas, sometimes crazy ideas that turn into something that really works well. They can be controversial, and um, I mean these are things I think that every producer, even if a studio, is looking for in that sense. And you already pointed out at the beginning that, of course, uh, the possibility of Netflix in that sense to finance these films and pick them and like produce them in a relatively short time and then enable huge audience to watch them. We haven't talked so much about audience, we can do that in a, in a, a later stage. Um, do you... Do you think that, you know, showing these, these clips, is it something where you feel can you talk about a bit of a project that you're working on right now that might be similar, 
or that might be the kind of things where you feel, well, they link into also the time that we live in that you are interested in telling right now? Um, yeah, it's, it's always hard to talk about these nascent ideas in development. You know, it's like if I said, so I'll just give that caveat. If I said do the right thing, but do the right thing had not come out and, you know, maybe you've seen she's got to have it, but nothing else, it'd be hard to interpret. So just have that in mind. But, um, but yeah, we, we've been able to engage even in the time that I've been there and a lot of this um, of the work predates me. Um, again, I've only been there four months, um, but where we're taking on projects um, that have a level of specificity, one that was announced a couple weeks ago is, uh, is, a, is a, a movie that Ron Howard's directing based on a book called Hillbilly Elegy, um, which talks about a specific um, culture set or geographical set in the United States um, that's essentially hillbilly culture or um, South sort of like um, very specific, oftentimes um, poor um, in, in terms of its makeup, but the story and the adaptation of the story is is for universal appeal. So it's one of the things that we are. It, it's a it's a drama. It's a it's also a comedy, uh, or it has comedic elements to it. It's also a coming of age story. So all of these mixed genres around a very specific thing is something that um, I think you know for Ron Howard to bite into, as he was able to do with with many movies, Beautiful Mind comes to comes to mind is something that's exciting and again possible at Netflix where it might be harder in the traditional studio system. I want to sort of see a little bit in the room, maybe you can raise your hand if there's something that one of you would like to tap into or maybe you have a completely different question for us to get a bit of a feeling. Good. We have some questions in the front row. We start with the front row. Also people in the back can raise their hand. We'll have a bit more trouble of seeing it, but um, maybe we start with you. Um, well, um, you, you, you said uh, that the timeline is about two years to have a film ready to launch. Does that also apply for animated projects? Um, no, I think the animated timeline is different. Uh, animation doesn't fall in my purview. There's, a, there's another division that does kids and families. Some of that's uh, animated features. Some of that's uh, serialized as well, so episodic. Um, and the timeline can be different. What I meant was, and it's a loose rule, which is you like to be able to envision the movie being made and being released within two years. Sometimes it could be a little bit sooner, a year, year and a half, or a little bit longer, two and a half years. But you want to feel like you can work with that momentum around it. I would, I would suspect for animation that they, they want to similarly um, relative to the project side, needs and complexity, a similar momentum. And, and how do you see Netflix welcoming adult animation, animation for adults, not just family, family films? Oh, I, I think that there's, from what I've been able to see, again, not my purview in early development, there's a, there's a large appetite for all kinds of, of animation. I think you can see on the series side, from something like BoJack Horseman to to other, other things that it, it, animation can serve a lot of different purposes. Hi, I'm from South Africa, I'm a distributor. I had a question about reach. In South Africa, they estimate there's about 400,000 subscribers to Netflix. Obviously, it's a very different country to America, but access to internet, access to data on phones is very expensive. What is Netflix's strategy to reach wider audiences in more de like developing countries? Um, it's a good question. I'm not exact, I'm not super familiar with the, the strategy around Africa and increasing subscribers. Um, that being said, I think that the idea is obviously to create more and more content that's gonna be appealing to, um, to these regions, probably of a global scale, but then I think in specific regions to, to spend more time and focus developing local, local content that might draw subscribers even faster.
I like the idea of you introducing yourself briefly because I think it's good for everybody to know. Thanks. My name is Katie. I'm here from New York City, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Can you tell us anything about nonfiction? Um, I love all those clips that you showed. Are there any nonfiction documentary clips you might have chosen if you'd been talking about that? Our timeline is also different. A lot of our budgets go into the post-production process, and we tend to have three to five year timelines, not two year timelines. What is Netflix thinking about in terms of docs? Um, only reason I didn't have docs up there is because I don't do documentaries at, at Netflix, so I'm like charged with the, the, uh, the narrative work. That being said, huge documentary um, appetite at Netflix, and I think both from a feature film level and a series level, a large degree of investment um, and commitment to that, um, both in sort of seeding it, but also seeing films that have come together and, and acquiring those. We acquired some at the Sundance Film Festival very recently. Um, we also just released a Fire Festival um, on Netflix as a feature doc, um, as well as, as the Ted Bundy series. So um, I don't want to speak for them, but I think high high level of interest and commitment, and probably different timelines than, than what I'm, I'm talking about. I was just talking specifically to, to the narrative film um, aspect. Probably you get that a lot, right? That people see you as like Mr. Netflix that can answer all the questions about Netflix from the strategies to the marketing to documentary and so on. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, I wish I knew it all, but I don't. Let's move on. Go ahead. Um, I'm a producer based in the UK, but I'm Canadian and German, and so the globalization idea, I think Netflix, being in 192 countries, has an ability to bring different views and stories to people who would normally not see them, so I'm wondering, based sort of to the South African point that you made about indigenous content going wider and what Netflix's narrative view on is sort of finding Nigerian films or different films to bring to other audiences, which is, I think, unique to you guys at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we've seen already um, a large investment in, in I, I don't want to say local content, but a wide variety of content, um, English language and, and other languages in different regions that is meant specifically to entertain people in, in those countries. I think a lot of the stuff we do let's say, out of my purview, something like Bird Box or something like that, hopefully has global reach. But, you know, if it's India and Sacred Games, something specific to, to India or, um, uh, or in Germany, Dark, um, or Dogs of Berlin or something like that on the series side, and I think you can probably expect that to increase on the, on the film side as well. Um, so I think that, that the goal is to have a variety of content for anybody interested in Netflix. You can watch things that are, um, you know, glo intended to be global in reach or very specifically nuanced to, um, to, to, your, to your area increasingly. Um, hi, I'm Thir, I'm from India. Um, I, since you brought up Sacred Games, um, I just had a question which was, apart from cultural specificity, what do you really look at in a story that can have cross-boundary kind of reach? Kind of like how Narcos was the first breakout um, series from Netflix that everyone across the world watched, including audiences in America who were not used to watching foreign language content. Um, what specifically in stories do you really look for which you think will kind of go global, per se? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, tr I look for, I mean, aspects of the story that don't have to um, have a specific regional context. Um, you know, so a love story, for instance, or an adventure, or an action film. In the in the first two clips, uh, Raiders or or The Matrix. To me, those don't have specific boundaries in terms of being able to engage an audience. They might be in a genre that's more popular certain places than another, but really it's sort of like um, the global reach of the story. Can I define it in a way 
that would be interesting to this room, similar to it would be interesting in a room in, in Los Angeles or, or a room in Mumbai. If, if I can, and I think that that story will be compelling, then I think that it can be a story that can travel. Some of them are, you know, super specific or, you know, I could give you examples of things that would be, like, interesting, really kind of only in America, but, um, but like I mentioned, Hillbilly Elegy, I think that that's a specific story, but one that can travel because really it's about a coming of age and how do you, um, how do you deal with your family background while trying to evolve um, from it in your own way. So we had quite some questions here in the first row. I see we're moved to the back here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm Mark O'Neill. I'm a producer from the very east coast of Canada. Uh, thanks for coming out and sharing. Um, so we have a slate of projects that I think suit your company uh, and their features. Uh, how best to approach, and I guess maybe everybody has a project for you, but uh, how best to approach Netflix in a professional fashion? Um, well, we, um, we work, as you might expect, with, um, with producers that we, that we know and also um, getting, um, getting scripts and, and projects in from agents and representatives that we know as well, um, lawyers, agents, managers, and producers. I think what we're trying to do more and more so, we have a pretty good grasp of it um, in the US and certain other regions, I think the UK, as well as an example, um, we're trying to you know, embed ourselves more and more to get to know local producers, um, get to know local talent um, so that we can have a more direct connection. Um, as of now though, the best way is probably to come in through a, a producer or a talent representative that, that's probably known to Netflix. Um, largely, probably people that you know or have heard of. Um, but in ways that you guys might not realize, we, we also take time to sort of do our own outreach. So it's not just an incoming, an incoming business. You know, we look at, we look at, of course, festivals, but we look at writing competitions. We look at um, places where we think that great stories and talent will emerge from. Um, and once we see that, we reach out and try to um, make incoming calls to meet with people as well. So that is also a reason that you like travel with a huge delegation, for example, to a festival like the Berlinale or attend the market, also to, in that sense, discover films being screened here or even projects being developed in the labs that the Talents has. That could be potential ways of also discovering. Yeah, I people. think one of the great aspects of, of Netflix at the moment is that we're involved in so many different kinds of, of content uh, making on a, on a global scale. So it's series, it's feature films. Um, at the same time, we're in 190 countries, and so we're interested in content that maybe we've acquired for the entire world. Um, at a festival like, like Berlin, um, there's a market in which you're seeing um, projects in some stage of development that you might be interested in, we might be interested in for the world, for certain regions. Um, we're also here, we have um, some series uh, people here from uh, from Europe, um, so we're able to acquire films. We're able to talk with um, talent, filmmakers, sales agents, producers about things coming up, and then we're also able to um, to showcase some of the films that that we've already um, uh, made deals on and, uh, and acquired. Um, as an example, Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, um, which we'll play tonight. Go ahead. Hi, uh, it's Carlos Grau, film critic from Cultural Resuena from Spain. And I, um, I want to ask you about the stages of distribution from the movies, from Netflix in the next years, with Roma from Cuaron. In this case, in Berlin, we have uh, we had some screenings in some theaters, and then came to Netflix. And once it was in Netflix, at the same time, in some theaters, we could watch again the movie. So simultaneously, the movie was in Netflix and the theaters. My question is, is do you think this is going to be an exception? Or in the future, we will see this model of 
simultaneity and another case, Elisa y Marcela from Spain, from Coixet, is going to be screened here in the Berlinale, then come to the theaters in Spain, and after that to Netflix. So you think that Netflix is so open to being screening in several stages? It's a question many people have, I think, in this room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you say anything about that? Yeah, I can speak generally um, about it. I think that what you're seeing with, uh, with Roma and uh, with other films that we'll release is that we're trying to do what we think is best for each individual film and project. Um, I think that a large number of, of the films that we've made have been in theaters in some place or some form, specifically um, around qualifications in a certain region, but there's not a, there's not one way in which we think about these things holistically and we're always open to sort of evolving and changing that based on what we think can be best for the films. Um, and, I, and, and I think that that's been, that's been the case with, uh, with Roma and it really kind of centers around an idea of consumer choice and giving people the most amount of choice. So in the case of Roma, as it plays in theaters, you're able to go to the theater and watch it, or you can watch it um, on, on any Netflix device, and that's purely your choice. Um, we probably don't want to make the choice for you that says, hey, you have to see it in a theater, or, you, or, or this way, we'd, we'd like you to make that choice. And in large part, we think about the choices for the consumers um, of Netflix, those that are paying subscription fees and what's the most fair or best for them, generally speaking. And we move to the other side of the room. Please raise your hand when you have the little, oh, it's here in the middle. And here we go. Um, I have a bit more, maybe, technical question. So on the one hand, for some countries, Netflix really helped because you avoided the kind of um, cinema distribution mafia, so to say, for some country, which we could skip and then go directly to Netflix. But on the other hand, it's quite closed circle. So as you just mentioned, you need to know right producers, right agents. And I have a question because we face something tricky when with one of our films, we work with Netflix through the agent. And I'm not sure that our deal was as clean as it's supposed to be, because the offer through the agent was a bit difficult and different than we expected in terms of the cut. And we never saw the real documents, how much we got for our film. So my question is, is there any other way how we can work, let's say, for the next project to avoid slightly not clean deals when we're dealing through the agent with Netflix? Because as I know, Netflix is very transparent, but other people, especially with some tricky country, it becomes more difficult for a filmmaker and producer to get the clean deal. Okay. Um, I can't speak specifically to, to your deal. I will say that, um, you know, in terms of the deals Netflix makes in general, very transparent. I think one of the key aspects is relationships with between talent and or producers and agents, right? So having a very clear understanding of how you guys are gonna communicate um, information between you two and then who's dealing with Netflix uh, directly. I, I, I would add to that by saying that I think one of the, the things that Netflix is, is doing increasingly is, is trying to have direct relationships um, around the world with talent and producers so that we're not going through third parties to talk about content, but rather to talk with um, producers and talent directly about it, and I think in that sense, be as transparent um, as, as humanly possible. Go ahead. You know, hi, go hi Tenno. My name is uh, Jan Dalsho. I'm a Norwegian uh, documentary producer. Uh, if you have, uh, what's Netflix's uh, answer to Jeffrey Katzenberg's new TV mobile video startup? And will you at any point be doing vertical 916 videos targeted for use in portrait uh, mode on smartphones? What was, the la what was that last part? <laughs> if, you, if you will uh, do 
vertical video in 916 targeted for smartphones in the future. I see. Um, I don't know that we have a particular answer. I mean, we to uh, to Quibi, I think is 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 what you're referring to, Jeffrey Katzenberg's company. Um, except for to say that we actually at Netflix like welcome more people into it. We're happy to see Disney come in, Apple come in, um, Amazon's obviously there, Hulu, Hulu, at least in the States, is already there, um, and, now, and now that. So we feel like more is more in terms of opening up um, you know, platforms for filmmakers, content makers, um, and then our hope and our strategy is to have the best filmmakers and, and content we possibly can, and we think that that will make the service valuable and people continue to subscribe. Um, but we don't feel like it's mutually exclusive, so you can add Netflix, you can have the Katzenberg service as well. Um, as far as uh, uh, the vertical format for, for mobile, I can't speak to it. Not, not an expert, don't know enough yet, um, except for I know that we're always evolving. We have a robust product and engineering um, apparatus that I think um, makes that experience, the user experience, um, both on mobile and on other devices, um, in my opinion, kind of second to none. So uh, I'm sure we're experimenting with it. And if it's, if we deem like it good for, for our consumers, then you'll see it. Let's um, move on there, maybe in the back. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samira. I'm, um, I'm working in the dubbing industry, in the German dubbing industry, and I have two questions. The one question is, how important is dubbing to you in, at Netflix? Like, uh, what importance does it have? And the second question, uh, are you planning to build a German headquarter at some point? Because, uh, or do you think it would help the communication between Netflix and the international? Uh, because at at this point, we don't have a German headquarter, as far as I'm concerned, so that, yeah. Um, on the first question, dubbing, I would say what we call subbing, um, which is subtitling and dubbing, massively important. It's a, it's a whole um, part of our, um, our system of, of having content ready to go, meaning you're, you're never going to see something just go out there without subtitling and dubbing. So we think about it a lot. We, uh, there's a department called Product Creative who's always looking to improve that and to make sure that the, the subs and the dubs are you know, as meaningful and accurate um, and creatively uh, correct and articulate to the, to the filmmaker's vision as humanly possible. So that's an ever-evolving thing and I've been extremely impressed with it since I've gotten to Netflix just because I think it's not like they've set us we've set a system and just left it we're continuing to improve it um, uh, as far as I know but I again don't know everything no, no plans right now for uh, an office in Germany that being said um, we're looking in in every market all the time to see how we can best operate efficiently in that market. Um, we definitely have a presence in Europe and so can get back and forth to Germany, but, um, but at this time, no plans. We have a couple of people as well from Netflix that's based in Amsterdam, actually, the headquarters of Europe, so they're also here in this room. Um, I have one question in between. I mean, you just mentioned um, uh, in, in answering uh, a question here, which made me wonder that, I mean, we're talking with you this year because Netflix, uh, you're the man of the hour, Tendo, in, any way, in a way. People want to know how to sort of get to uh, make films in some way. You're represented in that sense. I mean, we know that probably in a year from now, maybe even faster, there will be um, also probably US-based uh, other companies that will also start um, um, developing original content, they're already doing it at the moment, we will see it. Uh, we're talking about 
giant competitor, so to say. Is there anything in your department or in, in, in your team where you say, well, we are a bit ahead of them because we already are working on that and we have quite some successes to celebrate? Is there a strategy on your side where you say, well, that is the way we think we will find and link talent for a longer time also to, to Netflix? Are you working on strategies on that with your content team? Yeah, I, I think the consistent strategy, and it's going to sound maybe overly simplistic, but but it's really true, is, is to build sort of an apparatus that is the best place to work, period, um, for, uh, for filmmakers and talent. Um, and that, that doesn't mean just, you know, write a check and, and hopefully somebody delivers the thing. It means create a studio system and environment that can contribute um, and be additive in the process in terms of building out production plans, um, uh, building out a, a successful post-production period, you know, how we relate to, to subbing and dubbing. I think that we, um, we've done a lot to try to enhance the experience of, of, of Roma, as an example, um, on the platform um, of Netflix, and that was done in concert with, with the filmmaker. So, um, you know, what Alfonso Cuaron thought was important was taken and highly valued and then plugged into um, a system that's, that's, that's working for a vast amount of content. And so I think we think our competitive advantage um, is to be kind of the best place for talent to work. And that will allow people to um, want to come back and continue to work with us even as um, competitors ent enter the market. We're already here, frankly. And the best place is, in that sense, linked to uh, being there with both money, but also with, of course, the, the way of getting uh, content straight away to audiences. Uh, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, if the likes of either whether it's a platform launched by Disney or uh, Google or YouTube or maybe Apple and so on, they will probably say the same. Uh, because they want to be the greatest place for people to work with as well. Do you have a feeling that with also the experience that you said, uh, or the, the, the example you mentioned of Roma, other big names coming up as well uh, later on? I mean, you're working with uh, Scorsese, or Scorsese is finishing something for Netflix as well, The Irishman, which I think we're all looking very much forward to. I mean, having those kind, that level of names uh, with, with filmmakers with that track record, so to say, um, it's going to be a fight for talent in that sense, probably in the next couple of years, for each of these players, including yourself. Uh, yes, I do think I do think that everybody would say the same in terms of being the the best place for 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 a talent to work. But I think there there's an aspect that's easier said than done. Meaning, we we're talking about specific relationship within different regions in the world. Um, you know, do we have representation in Europe? Do we have um, interface with uh, talent and producers when they're when they're selling into the place, or, or are we just kind of a faceless place? So, getting to know um, uh, a market place and a region and a place um, in terms of how it will receive um, your content and also what content is is best to to make there is, I think, a huge part of it, and that um, is something that Netflix has, um, every day has more experience doing, because it is operating in 190 countries. So I think that that helps to the competitive environment, and also the experience for the filmmakers. Um, if Martin Scorsese wants to understand, you know, how the Irishman will come into Germany or go into India, we can talk in really granular terms with him about that. Um, also based on what he, what his desires are. Um, to the second part of it, uh, Scorsese is working there. We have another film with Noah Baumbach, Michael Bay, um, uh, Ryan Reynolds, some, some exciting um, talent coming up that we'll be announcing shortly as well. So I think every day that we can, show talent that this is a great place to work and then work with them, then it encourages more talent to come in the door. Moving further, go on. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Shraddha and I'm a producer from India. 
my question was uh, when like a film when it travels what is the criteria that netflix has when it makes an offering to a foreign language film because a lot of times what we've observed is that a, a film might have traveled to a list festivals but the offering that netflix makes to the film is pretty less because maybe we don't have a direct channel or a better representative inside netflix and some other film which might have not gone gone to a better a very good festival gets a very good offer because they have better representation within netflix so is there like a set rules or some guidelines that netflix follows while making that offer um i think that that speaks to to what i meant by getting to know a place better i don't think that there's a um a specific uh strategy around one festival versus another in terms of what the offering is i think that there's probably a number of decisions going into making how to value something some of its timing some of its subjective taste and then and then another part of it is is um i think maybe what you were indicating which is getting to know the tastes and the 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 needs wants of a particular market better and better um and so there is some trial and error in terms of how you value one piece of content um or film or a series versus another that we're constantly trying to learn evolve and like better so that we can make the right um investments in in stuff at the right at the right cost so perhaps you've seen stuff that didn't make sense to you and we've shown that didn't make sense to us too and then that will evolve or there was some value that we got out of it that maybe wasn't completely obvious in terms of uh the pricing so like what is the business model that netflix has like, like for example amazon prime relies a lot on its youtube channel like what is it that netflix is doing I'll repeat that quick, quickly because I think we only were the ones that heard that. So what is the invest thanks for the question though. What is the recoupment model? What is the business model because Netflix is investing so much? That's what you asked, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um in a way it's 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 the the simplest and the most complex answer which is um subscriber satisfaction essentially. So we can both in terms of increasing subscribers or people that are interested in having Netflix because a certain piece of content is available there ex exclusively or or amongst an, a wider offering so growing subscribers that's one way you recognize your investment and then the other is satisfaction of the subscribers you do have so there are ways in which we monitor are able to tell if people are watching the things that we put out there and to what degree they're watching it and if they're watching it to large measure then we want to invest more in that kind of content because it's it's satisfying the subscriber so for us the return on investment because it is a subscription based based business where you have um you know a set amount coming in all the time those people that are paying for it need to be engaging with Netflix and if they are then we're getting a return on investment and if they're not then we're probably getting less return on investment. Uh hi. Um my question is about I'm here. Sorry. There you are. It's easier. Yeah. I get up I guess. Um to what extent your originals acquisition decisions are driven uh by um data and algorithms? The the reason I'm asking is for instance in Turkey the first um uh, Netflix original series was actually a superhero series and it was never done before. was that based on let's say um the consumption patterns in turkey or whether the turkish subscribers were were um watching a lot of superhero series or got you um can't speak to that specific decision um don't know it didn't make it but um i can tell you that data while a part of the decision making process at netflix is just one data point but it's not the reason i don't think i mean in my time there there's been nothing bought or made or pushed forward because simply because data was telling you to do it you know make an action adventure 
that kind of thing. Um, I think there are general lines in which you say, listen, um, how you spread the money that you have to spend on content is telling you that generally speaking, these areas are of interest. And so if you have um, content in that, in that area or that vertical, then you're feeling pretty good about taking chances. But you still have to read the material, feel like it's going to connect, and then you can put it forward and use the data to sort of more help determine how much investment um, is really what I end up using data for, which is just sort of like, hey, what's the value proposition potentially for this based on how much we would spend and how much we predict uh, people would watch um, regionally or globally? And then, um, you know, towards going into uh, new markets or continuing to, to make original content, not a, not a, I mean, every day we get a little bit better at it, but there's a feeling, and I think that this gives a lot of um, freedom um, to people trying to make content, that you have to try things to know how it's going to um, play. And once you have that, then you now have a data point by which you can make better decisions. So it's a constantly evolving situation where you're encouraged to take risks, take chances, you know, based on criteria that's quite natural to all of us, which is, do I respond to it? Do I think it's funny? Do I think it's good? Do I think the filmmaker um, is interesting or has a particular point of view? And then, you, and do I think the price is right? And if you do, you can take a chance. And if you win, you do more. And if you lose, maybe you do less. I'm looking at the clock and I see that time is going very fast, but I still would like to, if, unless somebody stops us, um, give a few questions also from this side of the room. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm an actor from France and Brazil. Uh, my question is about... Um, discover new acting talent because we often talk about discovering new writing or you know directing or producing you know talent in general but um i heard of the witcher the new you know uh, series of film series i think like the the, the one with henry cavill uh, that you're doing um and if i'm not wrong i think the two main uh female characters yennefer and siri i think they're going to be played by actresses who are relatively you know, not known yet, not, not as Henry Cavill, uh, which is awesome, which is really good. So I wanted to know, is that uh, a kind of a new tendency or a new strategy uh, at Netflix, I mean, to discover talent that your customers, you know, the, the spectators see on screen, or is it a, a one-off in that case? Uh, I think, I don't think it's a one-off. I think that there's an appetite to discover new talent um, around the world, globally, uh, frankly, because um, the best talent, if we can get there first, um, then we probably pay a fair price as, oppo as opposed to overpaying to get them to work at Netflix. Um, I think y you mentioned one series. I think you could point to others like um, uh, Stranger Things where, or to All the Boys or Kissing Booth where we've, we've sort of broken talent or helped a lot of people discover talent um, to ever increasing successful degrees. You know, probably I'll go back to to, um, to even House of Cards, um, uh, where you had a Mahershala Ali, um, a Rachel Brosnahan, different people that are sort of being discovered all the time, and so that's that's a continuing appetite. And then, um, you know, frankly, within Netflix, we look towards um, other. I'm in feature films, but there's series, there's international series, and I look to them to say who's interesting in particular region, who's there, who, who are they excited about for the projects that we're working on, because they might know months in advance, even of the, of the series coming out, who's really talented. Um, and so we're able to p pull from internal sources as well, and we're constantly looking for new talent that way. Uh, hi, my name, can I? My name is Radovan from Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, I'm a producer, director. We do uh, documentary films, art films, but also uh, mainstream TV program uh, content. Uh, this, how are you going to be facing the uh, 
very specific situation of independent producers in Europe because we most of the films and, and content that we produce, we produce with uh, subsidies, with money that comes from film funds. So we can't really produce them for a private company. We have to produce them with a private company as a, as a co-producer. Are you going to be entry? Because it's, a, it's a probably most of, like quite a few people here are uh, producers. So are you going to be entering uh, co-productions or you will be only uh, producing yourself using us as only uh, service uh, organizations or uh, uh, are you going to be also like uh, willing to um, go in as HBO Europe for example they enter co-productions mm -hmm. uh, some of the minority co-productions they do as well so um, yeah I can't speak to the specific strategy of, of every region because I, I don't know it but in general I think that we have an appetite to figure out the best thing for the project if we're if we're interested in it, if that's partnership, we have a lot, a lot of history with, uh, with, with partnering, um, both uh, in the U.S. and around the globe. Um, so doing partner managed, where essentially someone else is financing, but we are are doing it together, or we're cash flowing, and they are um, they're managing the production. So seem, seemingly no problem with product with partnering. Um, and then in other areas where it makes more sense for us to fully finance or, for instance, we, we have the, the intellectual property, we own the intellectual property and we can fully finance production of it in film or, or series, we might look to do that um, in terms of, of what's best for that project. So um, I think the answer is there's no strict um, point of view on that. We're just looking at each individual project to determine what's the best way to go about making it if it's something that we're interested in. Okay, one last question, please. Your the hey, one. Hello, um, Jan Matuszyński. I'm a director from Poland. And I have a question which is a bit of, of a follow-up of what Radovan asked. Um, Netflix is a global company, but you, uh, you're you saying that you're very interested in working out stuff. And I wonder what is your perspective on films that should be in an ideal world, a uh, big European co-production in terms of international co-production with a director from an Eastern Europe country, uh, actors from France or England. How do you feel about that, that kind of uh, projects? Um, I think we'd be very interested in making you know, productions across the world. I mean, from my perspective, and again, I can't speak for um, the divisions operating specifically out of Europe in either international original series or even international um, or local language film. Um, but from the perspective of where I sit, we make films all over the world, um, sometimes set all over the world, and we try to populate it as such as best we can. There's obviously um, considerations like subsidies um, and, and, and legalities around working in specific places and who you can hire as well as um, union requirements and guild requirements that we have to respect depending on where we're shooting. But in general, we try to populate it um, as authentically and as widely reaching as possible. Um, we, want, we want everything that we do to play as globally as possible. And so when we can pull in aspects of that, both in terms of producing partnerships, um, basically behind the camera and in front of the camera, we, we, we definitely try to do so. I have a question for all of you. I mean, who after the session thinks like, I have a great original, controversial, um, crazy, but this is gonna be the next new thing and in 30 years we'll all talk and um, Tendo's successor will show this clip on the screen of Berlinale Talent. Raise your hand. Who has an idea? First row, Mark Great. will be quite a lot, so that's good. That's, I would say that's a good result. Um, another question. Who of you has a Netflix subscription? Raise your hand. So we need, to, we need to fill that a bit. Like all these people are waiting for those ideas. Tendo, thank you very much for making it all the way here after having been four months in the job and trying to ask all the, uh, answer all these questions that you did today. Um, I want to thank everybody here as well because I think one thing is clear, even though 
in an industry that's changing with new players we don't know so well, but we all watch them and we all subscribe to them apparently. Um, so like to get to know each other and to be in a conversation, I think is a big step uh, that uh, has been taken in the past months. This is one of them. Um, I'd like also to thank you for uh, each and everyone in this room to sort of, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's better in that sense to start saying, Let's, listen, we have new people at the table, let's see how we can work with them. And in that sense also see how we can maybe um, develop parallel ways of developing, producing, but also screening and watching films and distributing films. Um, thanks again for coming, thanks again for listening, thanks again for coming here, and hopefully this is the first one of you coming back many times to Talents. Thank you for having me, I've enjoyed it, thank you.